This is uh, Jim Fetzer, your host on The Raw Deal. Today being the 56th observance of the assassination of our 35th president, I'm going to devote the show to what happened to JFK, who was responsible and why. Uh, you won't be able to see it now, but I have 155 slides. I'm doing a video recording. And as soon as it's posted, you'll be able to watch it at 153news.net. Meanwhile, if you have questions, make notes and ask them during the second hour of the show on Sunday. I begin with the official account of the shooting, a lone demented gunman by the name of Lee Harvey Oswald, a disgruntled former Marine, allegedly fired three shots from the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository, scoring two hits, one of which injured the, the, the president without killing him, passed through his body and hit the governor of Texas, John Conley, the other, hitting him in the back of the head and killing him. This is a complete fabrication, totally removed from the facts of the matter. But here you can see in this image of Dealey Plaza, some key structures, including the County Records Building, the Dow Tex Building, the Book Depository itself, the Grassy Knoll area, the intersection of the picket fence with the Triple Underpass, the Triple Underpass itself, and the Grassy area opposite, all of which will figure in what I'm about to explain. There are more than 15 indications of Secret Service complicity in setting him up for the hit. Two Secret Service agents who would have accompanied the limousine were left behind at Love Field by Emery Roberts, the agent in charge of the presidential protection detail. Here's one of them, Henry Ripka, expressing dismay at being called off. A motorcycle escort was reduced to four who were instructed not to ride forward of the rear wheels of the presidential limousine. One of them observed it was the damnedest formation he'd ever seen. JFK's military aide, who normally sat between the driver and the agent in charge, was moved to the last vehicle along with the president's personal physician. The indications of complicity include not only the agents being left behind, but that manhole covers were not welded shut, open windows were not covered, and the crowd was allowed to spill into the street. In fact, the 110th Military Intelligence Unit, which ought to have been distributed throughout the city for crowd control, was ordered to stand down over the adamant opposition of its commanding officer. There's a photograph of how bad the absence of security really was, where we have the presidential limousine beside a bus, spectators 12 to 15 deep are spelling out into the street. Where a single assassin with a handgun could effortlessly have taken JFK out. It was outrageous. Governor Conley was instrumental in making a change to the motorcade route on November 18th, just four days before the event. Normally, a motorcade route once fixed is never changed, so the Secret Service can check every building and screen its occupants. This change brought the president past the Texas School Book Depository building. He could have gone straight up Main Street and got onto the Stemmons Freeway to arrive at the trademark where he was going to speak, but instead, they introduced a turn from, from Maine onto Houston and then a 110 degree turn back from Houston on to Elm, which was already a violation of Secret Service protocols, which require that the president never be subjected to a turn of greater than 90 degrees. In this instance, it appears to have been to slow down the motorcade without alarming the occupants while bringing them into the center of the kill zone. Most tellingly, the vehicles were in an improper sequence. The presidential limousine was placed first. Lower ranking dignitaries, such as the mayor and the vice president, should have preceded him. After all, you're coming to see Jack and Jackie. Once you've seen them, why would you stick around for Lyndon or the mayor of the city of Dallas? Reporters were moved to the rear of the president's 
personal physician to the last car, which put him in the worst location should his patient require emergency medical treatment. At Parkland Hospital, where the Mormon president was taken, a Secret Service agent took a bucket of water and a sponge and began cleaning up the blood and brains from the limousine. When onlookers noticed a through and through hole in the windshield, a vehicle was moved. Here is, in fact, a vision of the inside of the limousine. The driver, William Greer, of course, sat here. Roy Kellerman, the agent in charge in the passenger seat. Nellie Connolly in the jump seat behind the driver. John Connolly, governor, the jump seat behind Roy Kellerman. Behind them, Jackie, with a huge bouquet of red roses, sat beside the President of the United States. This was highly unusual. Where Jackie had visited before in Texas, she'd been given huge bouquets of yellow roses. I believe this was not only to indicate the location of the president, but to remind the shooters that Jackie was off limits. They must ensure that no, no harm should fall to her. Nellie Conley, meanwhile, had a big bouquet of yellow roses as she sat beside the governor. The event was filmed in part by at least eight different segments of film, the most important of which is known as the Zapruder for Abraham Zapruder, who is alleged to have filmed it with a Bell and Hal camera that used a, a 16 millimeter wide strip of film, though it was only filming down one side, an eight millimeter wide strip, then you'd have to take out the cartridge, turn it over to film down the other. So if you wanted to play the continuous footage, you'd have to split the film and splice them together. I have a whole book about it entitled The Great Zapruder Film Hoax. When fully wound, the camera ran for about 73 seconds, exposing about 15 feet of film. It was spool loaded with double 88 millimeter, eight millimeter film, 16 millimeter with sprocket holes on both sides, 25 feet of usable on each side, approximately four feet of leader at each end, a total of 33 feet of film per side. When one side was exposed, you had to manually turn it over and then continue filming to expose the second half. The size of the frames meant there was a total of approximately 4,166 frames on the total 50-foot reel of film, or about 2,000 frames on each side. As I'm going to explain, there was massive editing of the extant film, which has 487 frames, from which more, more frames have been removed than remain uh, from, from the original. Uh, John P. Costello, PhD in physics with a specialty in electromagnetism, the properties of light and of images of moving objects, has done a brilliant tutorial on how the film was edited, concluding that it was about 98% technically perfect, but where the other 2% revealed were the giveaway. You can find his tutorial on my assassinationscience.com blog. The first I introduced when I became internet savvy. This also, however, at assassinationresearch.com, which is an archive of JFK research that I co edit with John P. Costella. If you had been paying attention to the national news the afternoon of 22, November 1963, you would have heard prominent figures such as uh, D D Chet Huntley. Uh, and David Brinkley and others announced the findings reported from the physicians at Parkland's of two shots, one a uh, shot to the throat, a small wound, a puncture hole, uh, obviously fired from in front, the second a shot to the right temple that caused a fist side blow up at the back of the head, a, a finding attributed to Admiral George Berkeley, the president's physician. The Warren report would conclude that Jack had been hit twice from behind in the back, where the shot actually entered five and a half inches below the collar, just to the right of the spinal column, but where the description of the wound would be changed 
first to his uppermost back, then to the base of the back of the neck, by none other than Gerald Ford, a junior member of the commission, in order to make the magic bullet theory more plausible, and a second hip to the back of the head at approximately the location of the external occipital protuberance, that bump on the back of your head where you'd rest if you were reclining in a bathtub. If you put the four of those shots together, you would know that JFK was hit at least four times where David W. Mantic, MD, PhD, with a PhD in physics from Wisconsin-Madison and MD from Michigan, board certified in radiation oncology, which is a treatment of cancer using x-ray therapy, who is a leading expert on the medical evidence, now believes there was yet another shot to the head. Here's his uh, Pruder film, which runs uh, uh, 20, 27 seconds. I'm going to play it, and you'll be able to see it in the video version, where there's a jump as a motorcade approaches from Houston on to Elm. All of a sudden, you see the vehicles approaching the Stemmons Freeway sign. This appears to have been an edit necessitated by the fact that William Greer, the driver, swung out too widely nearly hit a concrete abutment, had to pause, hesitate, get back into line. I believe that would have been so disconcerting to the American public, they would have questioned the competence of the Secret Service, and therefore it was taken out. The other major edit occurred after the driver, William Greer, pulled the limousine to the left and to a halt to make sure JFK would be killed. That was an extremely important time interval in bringing about his death, about which I shall have much more to say. Most of you will be familiar with the film, including the rather violent back and to the left motion of the president's body, uh, which actually wasn't a part of the original scenario, but resulted from the merging of two different shots, where Jack was hit in the back of the head after Greer had brought the limousine to a halt. He slumped forward. Jack eased him back up and was looking him right in the face when he was hit in the right temple by a frangible or exploding bullet that set up shock waves that blew his brains out the back of his head with such force that when they impacted motorcycle patrol with Bobby Hargis riding there, he initially thought he himself had been shot. It turns out when they printed the frames to the film in the supporting volumes, the order of the crucial frames 3, 13, 14, 15, and 16 was altered to minimize that violent back into the left, which actually didn't occur. Because after Jack was hit in the temple, he simply slumped to the left. But they removed so many frames in, in editing the film that it greatly exaggerated the time span and the apparent violence of the motion. But Jackie was climbing out on the back of the trunk for a chunk of Jack's skull and brains. David Lifton, the author of what I regard as the single most important book ever published on the assassination best evidence, noticed this inconsistency in the sequencing of the frames and induced his then girlfriend to write to J. Edgar Hoover to ask if there had been a misprinting such that in the supporting volume, you go from 313 to 315, then to 314, then to 316, uh, 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 greatly reducing the apparent dramatic effect. And Hoover, rather surprisingly, wrote back and confirmed, yes, it had been a misprinting mistake. What they were seeking to conceal, of course, was these two shots an analysis which was by far the most scientific and important element of Josiah Thompson's book, Six Seconds in Dallas, which is based upon a frame-by-frame -frame study of the Zapruder film, uh, where it turns out that between frames 312 and 313, which is the scene in which you see Jack's head appear to burst apart with a great plume of, of blood, uh, that there's motion, forward motion of his head because of that shot fired from the rear. That's all that remains, that he continued to slump down and Jackie eased him back up is all removed, so that then you have the impact of the shot from the right front, violent back into the left. Uh, Thompson had a wonderful graph, which I'm showing here in relation to the frames, where you can see between 212 and 213, there's forward motion of Jack's head, 
and then the violet back and to the left. That was all that remained of what was a far more extensive sequence. The first frames from the Zapruder film to, to which the public had access were published in live. Most were unremarkable, but this one frame 313 posed special problems. The plate was broken twice to revise description six, which appears to be unique in the history of publishing. There are many indications this and other films have been editing, included the all but motionless spectators, the driver's head turns twice as fast as humanly possible, and the blob and blood spray, which appear to have been painted in. Blood and brains across the trunk and the drivers pulling to the left and bringing the vehicle to a halt had to be removed because it was such an obvious indication of Secret Service complicity in setting JFK up for the hit. Now, Costello did an analysis of the blood spray, which disappears much too rapidly. Here's a graph that break down the colors into green, red, and blue, showing the spray disappears within three frames or one sixth of a second. This is a physical impossibility. Even if you drop the lead weight from JFK's temple, it wouldn't drop into the car that fast. Scientists were also able to show the spray could not have been moving so fast that it shot right out of view before frame 314. Even if the blood could have, where would it have ended up? It would have gone all over the Conleys and the windows and the interior of the limousine if the shot had been from behind. The blood spray would have gone forward. But a frame published only weeks after the assassination in color showed no blood at all. This again is from Life magazine. As if this were not bad enough, when the US government report into the assassination was published in 1964, another frame, 323, was published, which again showed no blood, just a huge bloodless wound in the president's head. In fact, we have multiple frames where you can see that the blowout at the back of the president's head has been blacked out. Here's a particularly clear example thereof. There were also internal inconsistencies. First, in relation to the head wound. The head wound cannot be observed in early frames where it has been blacked out. When I reviewed later frames, however, with a suspicion that they might have so focused on the early that they overlooked it might be visible in later, I found it in frame 374. Larry Rivera subsequently discovered its outline by Jackie's white gloves in frames even earlier. So here it's 312. This is the frame from which we know there was forward head motion. And let me add, by the way, it was not only Josiah Thompson's analysis, but that when David Lifton uh, studied the films, he had his own suspicions and he took blow ups of these early frames to Caltech where Richard Feynman, then the most famous physicist in the world, applied a ruler to the blow-ups, and he, he already concluded there'd been forward motion between frame 312 and 313, in addition to the violent back and to the left motion. So that while Josiah Thompson has sought to disavow the double hip theory, because he has changed his course and sought to deny the existence of conspiracy in the assassination of JFK, which given the state of the evidence is frankly absurd. Richard Feynman had already confirmed it with David Lifton. Meanwhile, in 313, we have the blowout, the blood spray painted in. 314, you can see the appearance of what appears to be a blob, which may have originated by moving the blowout to the right front of to make it appear there was a blowout at JFK's forehead, which in fact did not occur. In frame 315, you can see more of the blob, 316, similarly, because that was a scenario they intended to promote. 317, particularly obvious that they painted out the back of the head. When I look at frame 374 and 375, however, I discovered you can actually see the blowout fairly clearly as Jackie is climbing out on the back of the trunk after this chunk of Jack's skull and brains. Here's a close-up of 374. You can see this little pinkish extension that's actually a bone flap 
when the frangible or exploding bullet entered JFK's head, it blew open a flag of bone right be before the right ear. It's about three inches in, in length and in, in curve. I'm talking about the blowout here. You see the gray matter, uh, which corresponds very closely to what David Mantig would discover when he studied the autopsy x-rays. So having suspected those involved in reconstructing the whole movies, including the Zapruder might have overlooked frames past 313 and 316 that display the wound to the back of the head, I found this image of the blowout in frame 374. So here you can see 312, but then afterwards where it's blacked out, you can see it's clearly not internally consistent. The Zapruder film itself is not internally consistent. Now, David Mantic, by virtue of being an expert in uh, radiation oncology, just told me before he entered the National Archives for the first time in late 1992 that he suspected he would discover both indications of a second shot to the head and evidence that the autopsy x-rays had been altered, where I told him that that was terrific because either way we would have what we were looking for, namely evidence that falsifies the official account. In fact, he found both. So here's the original autopsy x-ray on the left where David had told me that the contrast between dark and light was far too pronounced to be a normal x-ray. And when he applied a technique known as optical densitometry with which he had become familiar in physics, which enables you to reconstruct the relative density of the objects whose exposure to radiation created the image, he discovered there was an area here he identified as area P for patch that had either been passed by a material that was far too dense to be human bone or had been exposed to a massive uh, overexposure to obfuscate what had originally been present. So if you compare area P here with frame 374, you can see they're very similar, roughly like a cashew on its side, where you can see that JFK's hair partially extends into the region of the blowout where it's quite obvious these are complementary depictions of the same phenomenon. Larry Rivera, who's done completely brilliant work on the assassination, discovered that uh, Jackie's white glove created a background against which the defect in JFK's head was highly apparent in even earlier frames. Here you can see the glove. Well, Jack ought to have had a cranium, a solid skull right in this location, but does not. Here's her right glove. It's being silhouetted against her left. So there you have the two gloves evident. Uh, Larry identified here, he drew the area where we have the missing skull as highlighted by Jackie's white glove. Here's another showing the defect in the president's skull, which was quite massive. Here's another with blender. This is a 3D uh, you know, technical device for imagery, quite brilliant, where you can see this was an enormous, an enormous defect. Here's another variation. Look at the enormity here of the cavity in JFK's skull. So we have no doubt that JFK had a massive blow up to the back of the head based upon multiple lines of proof of which there will be more to come. Meanwhile, an additional sign of alteration, the Stemmons freeway sign was wrongly replaced. Comparisons of photos of the location and dimensions of the Stemmons freeway sign before the assassination revealed that it was replaced by mislocated images. The sign, in fact, had uh, bullet holes in the sign which were inconsistent with the official narrative so they had to take out the original from the film footage and replace it. But they did so wrongly demonstrating the sign was placed into the revised film without taking into consideration the optical distortion of the camera's lens. John Costello has done just sensational work. If this were authentic, all four of these lines, the blue and the, and the orange would be parallel, but they're obviously not. And you can see the major distortion here. Turns out that if you superimpose the images from the film over a photograph of the sign 
from exactly the same perspective taken prior to the assassination, you can see the enormity of the discrepancy. It's truly one of the most stunning revelations that the Zabruder film has been massively edited. And it continues to dumbfound me to this day that there are figures who profess to be leading experts on the assassination, including Robert Roden and Josiah Thompson, who insist that the Zapruder film is authentic. Indeed, according to Josiah Thompson, the closest thing we have to absolute truth about the assassination of JFK, which is, of course, complete and utter nonsense, as you can see from this GIF, where it demonstrates conclusively that when they replaced the sign in the, in the revised uh, uh, film footage, they did so wrongly. In addition, another sign in, in, in indication of editing internal to the film is the all but motionless spectators. Everywhere else during the motorcade, spectators are waving and cheering with great enthusiasm. During this portion of the motorcade, however, they were virtually motionless. The explanation appears to be that they took out the original foreground where you would have seen, seen the spectators reacting to the presence of Jack and Jackie and replaced it with footage taken when the pilot car passed, which was unexciting, uninteresting to the spectators, apparently because there was something in that foreground footage they did not want, they had to conceal and remove from the film. Here are a couple of images of spectators along the way wildly cheering as Jack and Jackie pass by. Here you can see again the enthusiasm from the crowd. There you can see John Connolly and Nellie. By the way, there was a, a huge argument between LBJ and JFK the morning of the motorcade where Lyndon was trying to get John Connolly, who had been his campaign manager, when he ran for the presidency against Jack Kennedy in Los Angeles out of the limousine, and Ralph Yarborough, a liberal Texas senator whom LBJ despised in. Jack, however, overrode him on the ground that the chief executive of the state should ride with the chief executive of the United States, which settled the issue. It was too late, however, to let the shooters know, and you see a rather grim visage, especially on John Connolly, prior to uh, entering the motorcade because he knew he was going to be in harm's way. Ironically, this obfuscated the politics of the situation because no one would imagine that Lyndon Johnson would ever place his crony and political ally, John Connolly, in a position where he might be shot. Here, here we have a frame where you can see the stationary uh, spectators standing by. They're not waving, not reacting, not cheering which is quite odd indeed and completely inconsistent with the behavior of the other spectators. I'm now showing the film again. You can see, first of all, that big jump from, from Houston on to Elm, where all of a sudden the motorcade is approaching the Stemmons Freeway sign, but notice none of the spectators are reacting. They're all highly passive. And we have now the explanation for why that should be the case. Jack and Jackie weren't there when that part of the footage in the foreground was actually filmed. We also have other proofs that the film has been massively edited, including external inconsistencies. For example, between the next film, which was shot from the opposite side facing the grassy knoll, and the Zapruder. They show a closer contact between Clint Hill, who rushed up, to push Jackie back down in the seat and lay across their bodies for protection, have much closer contact in the Knicks than they have in the Zapruder. Here are a couple of frames that show about how close they get versus in the Knicks film. You can see they're clearly in contact in the Knicks film, but not in contact in the Zapruder. So even though they re-edited the Zabruder and used it as a model to edit the other whole movies to the extent they overlap. They committed blunders along the way. Here you can see very clearly how in the Knicks, Clint Hill and Jackie are in close proximity, uh, but in the Zapruder, they are not. Also, in addition, there were witness inconsistencies that were very telling. For example, witnesses to the head wound 
at Dealey Plaza at Parkland and at Bethesda. Here, here's a wonderful collection of witness reports from Robert Grodin's book, The Killing of a President, where you can see Beverly Oliver, Phil Willis, his wife Marilyn Willis, and Ed Hoffman, all of whom were present at Dealey Plaza, reporting where they observed the blowout at the back of the head, which is where you, you, if you doubled up your fist and put it to the back of your head, that is where the blowout occurred. We also have many reports from Parkland Hospital, Dr. Robert McClellan, Dr. Paul Peters, Dr. Kenneth Salyer, Dr. Charles Carrico, Dr. Richard Delaney, Dr. Charles Carrico, Dr. Ronald Jones, Nurse Audrey Bell, all of whom saw this wound up close and personal, all of whom are consistent that the blowout was to the back and slightly to the right of JFK's head. Then we have even more witnesses, including Theron Ward, who was a justice of the peace, who had the Secret Service not forcibly stolen the body to get it under military control, would have conducted an inquest on the death of JFK. The only crime that had been committed was murder, which was a state offense at that point in time. There were no federal laws even against the assassination of a president or a vice president of the United States. Also, Aubrey Wright, the ambulance driver, then there were multiple witnesses from Bethesda when the body first came in, including Frank O'Neill, who was an FBI agent as a witness, uh, Gerald Custer, who was a radiation technologist who took the x-rays, Paul O'Connor, Floyd Reby, medical technical assistants, all of whom identified that blowout at the back of the head. Meanwhile, we have a further reports from Clint Hill, remember, he was Jackie's bodyguard who rushed up to push her back into the limousine and lay across their bodies. Clint Hill made a number of appearances on behalf of a book entitled The Kennedy Detail about the Secret Service in Dallas on 22 November. And he's been very consistent in reporting what his own actions at the time. Even if Clint actually touched Jackie, the films don't show him pushing her into the seat, which is what he has maintained for now, you know, over 50 years. In his formal report dated 30 November 1963 about the events of that day, a copy of which is archived at assassinationscience.com, he reports, as I lay over the top of the back seat, I noticed a portion of the president's head on the right rear side was missing, and he was bleeding profusely. Part of his brain was gone. I saw a part of his skull with hair on it, which is consistent with frame 374, but not with frames 313 through 316. Indeed, since this record was Warren Commission Exhibit CE 1024, at least some of its members and staff had to have been aware of observations of the first person to observe the head wound, apart from Jackie herself. But even the Kennedy Detail 2010 includes this sentence. And slumped across the seat, President Kennedy lay unmoving, a bloody gaping fist size hole clearly visible in the back of his head on page 217. An observation of enormous significance in relation to the autopsy photographs and x-rays, as well as to the authenticity of the Zapruder film. Indeed, uh, when Malcolm Kildup, the acting press secretary at the time, announced the death of JFK to the press, he pointed to his right temple and said it was a simple matter of a bullet right through the head, attributing that finding to Admiral George Berkeley, the president's physician, which was one of the reports that was put out, broadcast worldwide by the major networks at the time. Indeed, here's a, a description of the wound authorized by Dr. Robert McClellan, where you can see it was a very brutal blowout at the back of the head. When I edited my first collection of expert studies on the assassination, entitled Assassination Science, published in 1998, Charles Crenshaw gave me drawings of the wound to the back of the head. On the right, you can see from the back, on the left from the side, and you can see that it was an enormous, enormous blowout. 
David Mantic indeed did find evidence of a second shot to the head, a, tra a trail of metallic particles where the heavier particles traveled the furthest in accordance with the laws of physics from that shot uh, to the right temple, which was also broadcast that day. We also have witnesses to the throat wound at Dealey Plaza at Parkland and at Bethesda. Dr. Malcolm Perry, seen here on the right, had performed a simple tracheostomy incision on the wound, which Dr. Crenshaw also diagrammed for me. So as you can see on the left, it was wound, simply a small puncture wound in the throat, virtually at the midline. And then before the tracheostomy, and then afterwards, Dr. Perry performed a simple straight line incision through the wound, which he described three times during the Parkland press conference that was held after the announcement of his death as a wound of entry, explaining the bullet was coming at him. Uh, he was unequivocal about the wound at the time. Subsequently, when autopsy photographs surfaced in the late 1980s, JFK's face was shown to be completely intact. There was no blowout to the right front, as we saw from the blob in those images I've addressed previously. Oddly, JFK's eyes are open, where Chuck Crenshaw explained to me, as the last physician to observe the body, it was, was wrapped in sheets and placed in the large ceremonial bronze casket that he had closed JFK's eyes. Therefore, they ought not to have been opened in these photographs. But even the skeptics had to agree that either the Zapruder film or the autopsy photographs or both have to be forgeries given their inconsistencies. From the 1970s, Lifton had argued that the bright reddish white wound, which seemed to appear and shape up the snake up the side of the president's head, which he called the blob, completely disagreed with the descriptions of the head wound given by the doctors and nurses at Parkland Hospital where the president was taken. And as you can see here too, the wound to the throat, that small clean incision wound has been greatly enlarged to look more like what might be the effect of a wound of accident, which appears to have occurred at Bethesda a Hospital. Now here's the most important photograph from the assassination it was taken by Associated Press photographer James Ike Alchins. Here you see the presidential limousine in the foreground. If you look carefully right here, where his left ear would be if his left ear were visible, you can see a small white spiral nebula with a dark hole in the center, indicative of a wound of entry. And the president is already clutching his throat. He's already been hit. Now, uh, Jim Lewis, uh, a JFK student, has long since gone to junkyards in the South and fired high-powered rifles through the windshields to see if he could hit a dummy in the back seat uh, that would simulate the location of Jack Kennedy in relation to the entry through the windshield. He found not only does it create a small white spiral nebula with a dark hole in the center, but it makes the sound of a firecracker as the bullet passes by. Many of you will be aware that a lot of the witnesses in Dealey Plaza said the first shot sounded different than the others, that it sounded like a firecracker. Notice here in the background, in the area of the, the doorway of the book depository, there's a figure looking out who seems very strikingly to resemble Lee Oswald. And I'll return to this because we've been able to prove that it not only resembled Lee Oswald, it was Lee Oswald. In addition, surrounded by the fire escape in the Dow Techs, there is the window to a broom closet that was a part of a uranium mining company that was a CIA asset from which three shots were fired with a Mandlicker Carcano, the only unsilent shots that were fired during the assassination to create the acoustical impression of only three shots having been fired. And notice too, that although JFK's Secret Service contingent is just staring around as though they have no idea what's going on, Lyndon Johnson's Secret Service detail is already reacting with the door open here. But of course, Lyndon knew what was going on and therefore had an advantage in anticipating. Here you can see very clearly 
the small sp white spiral nebula with a dark hole in the center from that through and through shot. On the right, however, you see a substitute windshield the Secret Service would produce that only had some spider-like cracks caused by a fragment hitting from behind, which the Secret Service would maintain was the windshield on the vehicle in Dallas at the time of the assassination, which as you can see from this comparison with a photograph taken at the time, was obviously not the case. Indeed, you can actually see the hole in the windshield in the Zapruder film frame 225. A mortician who prepared the body for burial told an investigator that in addition to a large gaping hole in the back of the head, there was a small wound in the right temple and a wound on the back five to six inches below the shoulder just to the right of the spinal column. So here we're getting confirmation of the various shots to which JFK was subjected. Look at the notes here from Thomas Evan Robinson, who was the mortician who prepared the body for funeral wounds. Large gaping hole in back of head, patch pie, stretching something. He believes a piece of rubber over it. He thinks his skull was full of plaster of Paris, plaster, plaster of Paris at the time. Smaller wound in the right temple. A crescent shape flapped down three inches. That was the peak image I explained was blown open by the frangible or exploding bullet. Approximately two small shrapnel wounds in the face, which he discovered when they leaked embalming fluid. David Manick quite brilliantly inferred that those were caused by tiny shards of glass, which hit JFK in the face as a bullet passed through the windshield, thereby explaining it. There was a wound in the back, five to six inches below the shoulder, just to the right of the backbone, the first hit on JFK. The adrenal gland and the brain had been removed, other organs removed and put back. Most interestingly, he observed no swelling or discoloration to the face, meaning he died instantly, which is highly unsurprising given he had half his brains blown out in Dealey Plaza. Meanwhile, when the House Select Committee on Assassinations reinvestigated the case in, in, in 1977-78, they reconstituted the back of the head. And they claimed, and this is a, a diagram, by Ida Docks, where you can see what's supposed to be a hole at the top of the head. Now, interestingly, they had removed the wound that the Bethesda pathologist had identified as having hit in the vicinity of the, of the external occipital protuberance, that bump in your head where you'd rest your head if you were reclining in a bathtub four inches upward, which would be a, an astonishing blunder from physicians of any degree of certification and which you cannot actually see in the photograph, though the skull flap is quite obvious here, as you can see. Uh, when the House Select Committee on Assassination reinvestigated the case, its medical panel concluded the entry wound was actually four inches above the entry location previously specified. It was depicted in diagrams, right, but not visible in photographs. Wow. This is all the more remarkable given that the physicians had given a very exact mathematical depiction of the wound to the back of the head in the formal autopsy report, which had shown a missing back of the head. In fact, David Lifton was so astonished by this description that he read it to a, a physician expert and asked what it sounded like uh, from the wound description itself. And the response was like the, the subject had been hit in the back of the head with an ax. What had occurred, and Thomas Evan Robinson was one of two witnesses who observed this take place, is that James Humes, the pathologist in charge of the autopsy, who had never conducted an autopsy on a gunshot victim before, took a cranial saw to the skull of JFK and greatly enlarged the wound from the fist-sized blowout observed at Parkland to this whole back of the head. I relate them as follows, that the blowout in Parkland is like the heel of a huge foot, uh, the, the whole missing back of the head, which was then reconstituted by the HSCA. I was so dumbfounded by this result that I reached out to Cyril Wack, the famous medical examiner of Allegheny County, who's been involved in many celebrated cases, 
and asked Cyril, I said, how did the man medical panel account for the major discrepancy between the enormous blowout described with mathematical precision in the Bethesda autopsy report and this reconstitution of the back of the head, head with a small hole at the top of the center? And Cyril replied to me, I'll have to check my notes. Meanwhile, David Manning had done work on what's known as the Harper Fragment, this very significant chunk of skull that was discovered in the grass in Dealey Plaza the following day by a medical student by the name of Billy Harper, who took it to his uncle Jack Harper, MD, on the staff of Methodist Hospital, who shared it with the chief pathologist, A.B. Carnes. He and three others identified it as occipital bone from the back of a human cranium. They took photographs of the piece of bone known as the Harper fragment before turning it over to the FBI, which was a good thing because like other evidence in this case, it was subsequently misplaced. David W. Mantic has identified the location on the back of the president's skull from which it was blown out as murder in Dealey Plaza, the second of my three early books published in 2000 explains. Not all of the evidence in this case was altered, fabricated, or otherwise fake. Some of it was simply lost. But notice how the Harper fragment itself falsifies the House Select Committee's reconstruction, because there is no massive missing chunk of skull, which was very substantial. Not only that, but the House Select Committee re reconstitution of the skull is inconsistent with observation by physician after physician at Parkland. Dr. Crenshaw, Dr. Jenkins, Dr. Carrico, Dr. Perry, Dr. McClellan, Dr. Baxter, Dr. Kemp Clark, who is a chief of neurosurgery, that there was cerebellar as well as cerebral tissue extruding from that fist side blowout, where the cerebellum is a compact part of the brain just above the brain stem. There's no way you could have possibly had extruding cerebellum from the HSCA reconstruction of the wound, which shows it was complete and utter nonsense, to put it in a single word, bullshit. So we know JFK was hit at least four times, once in the throat from in front, once in the back from behind, and twice in the head, once from behind, and once from in front. The shots to the throat and to his right temple appear to have been fired from above ground level sewer openings on the south and the north side of the triple underpass, or so we previously believed. We've now discovered the shot to the throat was actually fired from inside the triple underpass, as I shall explain. Meanwhile, we also have over 60 witnesses to the limousine stop, where some saw it slow dramatically, others saw it come to a complete stop, where the limo slowed dramatically as it came to a complete stop, this was such an obvious indication of Secret Service complicity that it had to be removed. John Costello has done a collation of eyewitness reports about the assassination, which includes dozens and dozens about the limo stop. Some reported seeing it slow dramatically, others that it came to a complete stop, which makes sense since from different positions. Different witnesses would have seen it slow dramatically as it came to a complete stop. Among them is Tony Foster, who was interviewed by Deborah Conway in 2000. As Daniel Gallup has observed, Foster seemed to have no idea that her recollections contradict the official record. Tony told Deborah, for some reason the car stopped. It did stop for a second. I don't even know why it stopped. And all of a sudden it sped up and they went under the underpass. I could never figure out why the car stopped. The way she delivers these lines, Gallup observed, I doubt Tony had ever seen the extant Z film and had no idea her recollections contradict that film. He said he was reminded of David Lifton's early 1971 interviews with the Newmans, who also said the limo had stopped. They had no way of knowing at the time that the Z film showed no such stop. All of this is to say the earliest recollections of individuals are likely to be the most significant, he added, especially if there is evidence of a lack of exposure to contrary viewpoints that might influence memory. Here are a few more examples. Billy Lovelady on the steps of the Texas School Book Depository. I recall that following the shooting, I ran toward the spot where President Kennedy's car had stopped. Roy Truly, 
who was both Billy and Lee's supervisor in the book depository. The car, I saw the president's car swerve to the left and somewhere down in this area later, Mr. Bell had questioning him. When you saw the president's car seem to stop, how long did it appear to stop, Mr. Truly? It would be hard to say over a second or two, something like that. I didn't see, I just saw it stop. I don't know, I didn't see it start up. Mrs. Earl Cavill, four cars behind the presidential limousine at the top of Elm Street at the time of the shot. I was aware that the motorcade stopped dead still. There was no question about that. Later, as I told you, the motorcade was stopped. Later, Mr. Hubert questioning her. That was when your car at least had come to a standstill, Mrs. Cavill. Every car in the motorcade had come to a standstill later. We were dead still for a matter of some seconds. Meanwhile, Gene Hill and Mary Mormon were there. They also saw the limousine come to a complete stop. They were in the street at the time, but in the revised Zapruder film, they are shown in the grass. Here are a couple of frames. This is 302 on the left and 303 on the right. Uh, Roderick uh, Ryan was a cinematic expert who was consulted by Noel Twyman in the preparation of his masterful book, Bloody Treason, published in 1997. Uh, Noel asked Roderick why the background was blurred in frame 302, but not in frame 303. And Ryan explained that the camera was panning the limousine in 302, but not in 303, where it was stationary. On page 159, he added he'd shown it to his son was also in the film industry, and he agreed it was moving in 302, but standing still in 303. We'll concentrate on a photograph that appeared in Life magazine as we continue our conversation. The limousine and the motorcycle are very sharp, including Jack and Jackie, Governor John Conley, and the cop on the motorcycle. Notice the keyhole below the front door handle of the limousine. There's virtually no blurring here. And yet the shutter on Zapruder's movie camera was open almost half the time. That lets us figure out how far the limo had moved when the shutter was open for just one frame, which is shown here, amount of blur that ought to be present, except there's no such blur here. So either the limo and everyone in it or the whole background and the man in umbrella in the foreground or some combination of the two should be blurred this month when it obviously is not.
we have a great deal of additional evidence of the manner in which the Zapruder film was edited, revised, to conform to the official account that would be forthcoming with certain inconsistencies. Here we have Mary Mormon and Jean Hill, for example, who were there to take photographs. Jean even called out, hey, Mr. President, look over here. We want to take your photograph. As Mary stepped into the street to take a very famous photograph. She was using a Polaroid camera, which required the application of a developer, which Jean did, and then put the photographs into her pocket. They both affirmed they stepped into the street. Jack White, who did brilliant work on JFK, even discovered that Mary had stepped off the curb before Jean had, or in a frame from the next film. You can see that the top of Jean's head is too high above the top of Mary's head, where Mary's about five foot two, Jean's about five foot seven. The distance in their height here is obviously more than five inches. Although this next frame is blurry when enlarged to this size, it's clear enough to show that Mary's head, the lower circle, is so far below Jean's upper circle that Mary had stepped off the curb before Jean did. Also note that she seems hunched over to take the photo instead of being upright as in Zapruder. It's interesting to observe that they were under surveillance because virtually as soon as the motorcade had disappeared, they were approached by authorities who took, uh, who took the photographs away from uh, Jean and questioned her about how many shots she'd heard. And when she insisted she'd heard at least four or five, they told her, no, that wasn't possible. There were only three. In other words, the involvement of the government in this was massive, and they were paying a great deal of attention to the spectators who were present in Dealey Plaza at the time. Here's Mary's photograph, known as the Mormon, uh, very significant, taken just a fraction after Jack was hit in the right temple. You can actually see what appears to be a chunk of his skull and brains on his shoulder. It may well be in motion here, but here's the photograph. One of the most important elements of this film is the discovery in this area here, just above uh, the concrete abutment there, a figure known as Badge Man, who appears to be uh, a person in a Dallas police officer's uniform firing a shot. Uh, Jack also noticed that there was actually a line of sight internal to this photograph, which meant that Mary's camera had to be on that line of sight when she took the photograph as a way of ascertaining her location. Because figures like Robert Groden and Josiah Thompson want to insist they were on the grass, since otherwise it would be obvious proof of the alteration of the film, which they're intent upon denying. So David Mantic and I took surveying equipment and went down to Dealey Plaza to test Jack's hypothesis. And by very precise measurements, we ascertained that yes, indeed, Mary had been in the street when she took her famous photograph. There are also witnesses to the other film. This is, uh, appears to be uh, uh, the Zapruder before it was edited, or at least in a partial, a state of only partial editing, because it's much more complete than the version we have today, which you've now seen already several times. Erwin Schwartz, William Raymond, Rich De La Rosa, Gregory Burnham. An associate of Abraham Zapruder, Erwin Schwartz, viewed the film in what may have been its original state at Eastman Kodak, where it was developed. Nearly 60 witnesses have reported that the limousine slowed dramatically or came to a complete halt. As Vince Palomar has explained in a chapter of Murder in Dealey Plaza 2000, when Noel asked him about the limo stop, he was vague and could not recall, but when Noel asked him about the effects of the fatal headshot, Swartz was quite specific and very graphic. He said that he had seen Kennedy's head suddenly whip around to the left, that he had seen an explosion of blood and brains from the head, that it had blown out to the left and rear. Wyman pressed him on this crucial point, but Schwartz was emphatic. His account may be found in Bloody Treason, page 1997, which of course is consistent with the report of Officer Bobby Hardis riding to the left rear, who'd been impacted with that debris so hard that he initially thought he himself had been hit. All these witnesses to the other film make four important observations. The other film includes a turn from Houston onto Elm. 
It shows Greer bringing the limousine to an abrupt halt. During the limousine stop, JFK is hit twice in the head, once from behind and he slumps forward, once from the front and he slumps to the side. Greer watches this happen the whole time and then hits the accelerator. Here we have further confirmation of the blowout to the left rear from Secret Service agents such as Sam Kinney and Vincent Gulo Jr. Vince Palomaro, who is the leading assassination expert on the Secret Service, wrote to Gulo to explain that Kinney had told him of his discovery of a piece of the right rear of the president's skull in the limousine during the flight back to Washington, D.C., and that another member of the detail had become nauseated from observing the blood and gore on the limousine trunk. Gulo confirmed Kinney's statements to Palomara, saying he was totally familiar with the facts as Palomara had outlined them. In addition, the motorcycle escort officers were all confirmatory. Indeed, it was Larry Rivera who rediscovered the work that Fred Newcomb had done in interviewing the motorcycle escort officers in 1972 and painfully transcribed transcripts to ascertain the content of their reports. They confirmed that during the limo stop, he was hit at least twice in the head, that Officer Hargis parked his bike, dismounted, and ran between the cars to the grassy knoll, which of course would have been impossible had the cars been in motion. Officer Douglas Jackson, riding on the right, rode his bike up the grassy knoll until it fell over and he proceeded on foot that five Secret Service agents dismounted the Queen Mary as they referred to their Cadillac and surrounded the presidential limousine. Here you can see now in this annotated version of the Alchins, where on the, the right-hand side of the limo, left looking at the photograph, we had Officer James Cheney and Douglas Jackson, and then all right, we had Bobby Hargis and, and Billy Martin. Here you see Hargis appears to be slowing down at the time Clint Hill is rushing forward, which appears to have taken place while the limousine was stationary. A lot have questioned how rapidly Clint Hill could have run to have caught up to the limousine, which is shown going about 11 miles an hour in the Zabruder film, though by Secret Service protocol, it should not have gone less than 30 miles an hour but that, of course, it was stationary, explains how Clint Hill was able to accomplish his feat. Larry has reconstructed from the transcript what happened, how Hargis parked his bike, ran between the limousines up to the grassy knoll, how Jackson motored up the grassy knoll until it fell over and then proceeded on foot, and how five officers dismounted the Queen Mary and surrounded the JFK limousine. We also have independent footage showing the marks the motorcycle made when, when Officer uh, uh, Douglas motored up the grassy you knoll. You can see them from the Bell film showing what appear to be tire marks running up the embankment. Some of the stories published in the national press about the event actually included witness reports of seeing a motorcycle officer ride up the grassy you knoll. Here you have. Uh, 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 Officer Hargis hesitating as he about to return to his limousine. Here you see Bobby Hargis where the limousine is, is parked. This is Gene Hill and Mary Mormon. And of course, this is Beverly Oliver, known as the Babushka Lady. She had a brand new camera she took of the uh, film footage facing the grassy knoll. That would have been extremely informative. But the FBI approached her about two days after. She still had the camera in her purse and relieved her of the footage, which she, alas, has yet to see again. You can find Larry's brilliant work on this subject in two videos, which I believe are still available on YouTube, the JFK Horseman Part 1, the JFK Horseman Part 2, uh, uh, really stunning stuff. Meanwhile, for those who are unaware of how the, the film was substituted, they used the National Photographic Interpretation Center in Washington, D.C. as the location for making the switch. So an eight millimeter all-ray split film developed in Dallas was taken to the NPIC on Saturday, the 23rd of November, 1963. They didn't even have an eight millimeter projector and had to ask a shop owner open his store. 
in order to buy an eight millimeter projector so that they could view it. They prepared briefing boards based upon this film, which appears to have been the original from Dallas. However, the following day, an eight millimeter unsplit film that had been developed in Rochester in a secret CIA lab called Hawkeye Works adjacent to Kodak headquarters was brought to the NPIC on Sunday, the 24th of November, to replace the original. And another set of briefing boards was prepared. Different crews were working at the NPIC on Sunday and Saturday, where it would require Douglas Horn, who had been served as the senior uh, advisor on military records for the Assassination Records Review Board, distilled the exact details of how it was done in volume four of his five volume inside the Assassination Records Review Board, and actually absolutely stunning reconstruction of the events, the deception, the cover up and so forth, uh, for those who are serious in their study. Uh, having been the chief analyst for military records. Why it had to be fixed? Well, as you already know, JFK was hit at least four times in the back from behind and the throat from in front and at least twice in the head, once from behind and once from the right front, uh, where obviously any shots fired from a location other than the sixth floor of the Texas Book Depository would have implied additional gunmen. Indeed, we have identified at least six shooters who fired at least eight to 10 shots, possibly more. Only Domagard has now identified a seventh about whom I agree. And we have now seen photographs of yet an eighth shooter behind a tree on the grass opposite the grassy knoll. You would have thought that was an unlikely location for a sniper. But I've seen one photograph of him holding his rifle in the possession of Rick Russo, another in the possession of Ed Tatro. So we have two independent photographs confirming the eighth shooter. Most of them, their identities, their name, rank, and serial number are known, as I am going to explain. Just to return once again, then, to the famous Alchem's photograph, we have that a through and through white spiral nebula with a dark hole in the center in the windshield. We have a figure in the doorway, which turns out to be Lee Oswald, indeed uh, Harold Weisberg in his Whitewash series, already 1967 in the second volume called Photographic Whitewash. The last four pages were devoted to the efforts of the Warren Commission staff to conceal the fact that Lee Oswald had been in the doorway observing the motorcade as it passed by, which obviously means not only can he not have been the lone demented gunman, but he cannot have been one of the shooters. Then, of course, we have that window in the broom closet of the book of the, of the uranium mining company that was a CI asset, and LBJ security responding before JFK seemed to have any idea what's going on. So the actual sequence of shots looked a whole lot like this. The first shot the, to, that hit Jack in the back was fired from the top of the county records building. I'll identify the shooter and so forth. He appears to have taken a later shot that, that hit near a sewer opening here, but was wildly off the bar. The shot that hit Jack in the throat was actually fired, it turns out, from inside, inside of the triple underpass, not from the vicinity of the South Knoll, as we originally believed, but where Gary King, Larry Rivera, and I have visited this location, and the alignment for the trajectory is perfect. Then we had... The, the three shots fired from the Dow Tax, uh, uh, two of which missed. One hit a chrome strip of, uh, uh, above the uh, windshield of the limousine. The other missed and hit, hit injured a distant bystander and hit the concrete here, a chip of which actually cut the face of James Tank. You had multiple shots being fired from the Texas School Book Depository at John Conley in the mistaken belief that it was Ralph Yarborough. Then we have a shot fired from the grassy knoll. This appears to be the one caught in the Mary Mormon photograph, but where he appears to have pulled his shot. So it wound up in the grass because he would have hit Jackie and they were under strict instruction. She must be not be harmed. And then the shot from the intersection of the triple underpass and the picket fence, which hit Jack in the right temple 
and, and, and set up those shock waves that blew out his brains, left the mansion that David Mantic now believes there was a third shot to the head that must have been near simultaneous with a shot fired from uh, the intersection of the triple underpass and the, and the, and the picket fence from the South Knoll behind that tree that appears to have entered Jack's left temple. So we had had conflicting reports that were thought to be innocent because of just left-right disorientation, but where it now appears that they were all accurate reports, only now being understood to be the case. The first shot that hit, which struck Jack in the back, appears to have been fired from the top of the county records building by Dallas Deputy Sheriff Harry Weatherford. He used a 30 6 to fire a man liquor carcana bullet fitted with a plastic collar known as a sabo, which hit JFK five and a half inches below the shoulder just to the right of the spinal collar. This was a shallow wound with no point of exit. According to researcher Penn Jones Jr., Weatherford was a crack shot and was on top of the Dallas County Jail building at the time of the assassination. A researcher once asked him if he shot JFK. Weatherford replied, you little son of a bitch, I shoot lots of people. Jones also wrote that a custom-made silencer for a rifle had been delivered to Weatherford a few weeks before the assassination. Jack Lawrence, a U.S. Air Force expert who had gone to work for the automobile dealership that provided the vehicles, remember all those different makes and models, for the presidential motorcade just a few days before the assassination, fired the shot that passed through the windshield and struck JFK in the throat from, I then thought, the south end of the triple underpass, but actually from inside the triple underpass. What, get, what Larry had sorted out is there's an electrical box there, a metal box that would be a perfect place to conceal a weapon. He appears to have used a new a rifle that would, could be folded up. You could actually carry it under your jacket. No one would be aware you had it. New research from the new, which has been discussed in the new JFK show, which Gary King, Larry Rivera, and I do on a weekly basis, which is archived by Gary King at 153news.net, includes reports that the weapon he used was an experimental model of which only a few were in the possession, one of which by the Air Force uh, uh, General Curtis LeMay, who may have been given to Jack Lawrence to be his assurance that he was acting in the best interest of the nation. After all, if you're an Air Force expert and the chief of staff of the Air Force tells you to shoot the president, you're almost certainly going to do as you were told. Meanwhile, Nestor Tony Escadro, an anti-Castro Cuban recruited by the CIA, fired the shot that hit JFK in the back of the head after the limousine was brought to a halt. He fired three shots with two misses using a Mandlicker Carcano, which were the only unsilent shots fired from the Dow Tax, which housed a uranium mining corporation, Dallas Uranium and Oil, that was a CIA front. There's even a, a, a statue for Escadro in a, a Freedom Park in, in Little Havana in Miami. Uh, which is very peculiar because this is a completely inconspicuous figure. There's another statue there to Jose Marti, which freed Cuba from the Spaniard. So why there should be a statue to Jose Marti, but also one to uh, Tony Escadro is baffling. If you ask someone there in the know, they would tell you it was because he took care of business. Meanwhile, here you can see the one shot that missed. Uh, because the man liquor Carcano was such an inaccurate weapon. And you can see the scratch on the face of James Tag. This is also where the miss, the second miss fired by Harry Weatherford from the top of the county records building wildly missed, but, but made marks on the pavement adjacent to that sewer opening. Roscoe White, a Dallas police officer with ties to the CIA, fired from the grassy knoll adjoining the motorcade route but seems to have pulled his shot because it would have hit Jackie. So his shot went into the grass where it was picked up by a Dallas police detective by the name of Day and has not been seen since. His son subsequently discovered his diary but gave it to the FBI and it's not been seen since either. Uh, the fact is that this guy appears to have been the body double for Lee Oswald in relation to the backyard photographs 
Larry Rivera has done superpositions of the body, and Roscoe fight White fits him exactly. He also appears to have been responsible for taking out, for assassinating as many as 50 witnesses to the JFK assassination. Meanwhile, Malcolm Mack Wallace, shot from the Dallas Book Depository, appears to have murdered a dozen people for Lyndon Johnson, including his own sister. Mack appears to have fired from the west side of the Book Depository at Texas Governor John Conley in the mistaken belief he was Senator Ralph Yarborough, whom LBJ despised. Wallace's fingerprint was found on one of the boxes in the assassin's lair in the Book Depository from which Oswald allegedly fired. Frank Sturgis, later complicit in the Watergate robbery, who also appears to have been connected to the CIA, uh, uh, appears to have been fired from the north end of the triple underpass, the shot that entered Kennedy's right temple. Indeed, we have confirmation from Frank Sturgis himself. He is known to have ties to Meyer Lansky, the n a notorious crime syndicate kingpin, and confessed his role to a New York City Gold Shield detective when he was arrested attempting to kill Marita Lawrence. That would be Jim Rothstein. I discussed with him about this. When, when uh, Sturgis entered uh, Marina's apartment to kill her, Rothstein put his gun in Sturgis's mouth and his partner up to his chest, and they took him into custody. He gave him the throwaway line, nice shooting, and Sturgis said that he fired at J he shot JFK because he had abandoned the brigade at the Bay of Pigs and because he had uh, uh, you know, uh, betrayed the country uh, by dalliances with other women who were spies. Jack White has raised the question, by the way, who shot the Zapruder film because there are images uh, from other photographs taken that suggest his secretary, Marilyn Seitzman, was actually blocking his view, so he cannot have actually taken all of the footage that was attributed to him. In my opinion, the strongest proof that Zapruder was complicit is that during an interview he gave on television, he put his hand up to the right front, not to the back of the head, as though a blowout had occurred there. But in fact, there was no blowout that occurred there. Indeed, uh, uh, Jackie would testify that from the front, his face looked perfectly normal, but that she had a terrible time keeping his skull and brains together at the back of his head. Meanwhile, here's a, the image of the man in the doorway and of Lee Oswald when he was arrested. There's obvious signs of manipulation of the area of the doorway and the altions because look here, uh, the man in the doorway has no left shoulder, which is anatomically impossible. When they introduce the black tie man into the film, he has a long sleeve, richly textured shirt, a t-shirt. Uh, he has the right height, the weight, the build of Lee Oswald. Indeed, the Dallas Police Department were so aware of the striking similarity that they made Lee remove his outer garment in order to pose for a mugshot wearing only his t-shirt, where Ed Tatrell has reported that Marina remembers having laundered this richly textured shirt, which apparently Lee brought back from Russia. A photograph that was from the backyard set used to frame Oswald for the crime appeared on the cover of Life magazine. You can see he's holding the man liquor Carcano with which he's alleged to have shot the president. He's got a revolver here with which he's supposed to have shot Officer J.D. Tippett. He's holding two communist newspapers, the worker and the militant, which Jack realized have, have no dimensions and therefore could use as a internal yardstick to determine the height of the individual. All this means is supposed to, in a single package, demonstrate that Lee had the motivation as a communist and the means of the weapons to commit the crimes. And obviously, because he was at the book depository, he had the opportunity. So this was like the linchpin of framing Lee Oswald for a crime he did not commit. Jack observed that if you'd use the dimension of the newspaper, then you can ascertain the height of the individual, which turns out to be too short to be Lee Oswald, who is about five foot ten. But using that measuring rule, ruler, you can he was only five foot six, which means that either the individual they used to stand in for Lee Oswald was too short, or what appears to be the pay, case when they put in the newspapers, they put in them in a bit too large. 
and thereby compromise the height of the figure using it as a yardstick. Jack also noticed that while there are four of these photographs, that no two handheld snapshots should match. Nevertheless, Lee Oswald's face is an exact match in all four. When Lee was shown one of these photographs by uh, Will Fritz, who is the homicide detective investigating the case, he said that it was his face pasted on someone else's body that he knew something about photography and that with time he'd be able to prove it. He, of course, never had the opportunity. Uh, in the meanwhile, we have from uh, 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 Blakey, Robert Blakey, who is the head of the HSCA. He was the executive director of his reinvestigation, which showed studies that suggest that they are uh, fabrications. Observe, if the backyard photos are invalid, how they were produced poses far-reaching questions in the area of conspiracy, or they evince a degree of technical sophistication that would almost necessarily raise the possibility that someone conspired not only to kill the president, but to make Oswald a Batsy. I say, well, welcome to the club. Blakey's been very keen on blaming this on the mob, but that does not withstand critical inspection. Jim Mars and I co-authored an article about the backyard photographs, which you can find archived on my blog at jamesfetzer.org, including observing, as had others before us, that Lee had a rather pointed chin, and yet in the backyard photographs you have a blocked chin, and that there's an insert line between Lee's lower lip and the blocked chin. It just so happens that Roscoe White had a blocked chin like that on the figure in the backyard photographs, and an odd bump on his right wrist, which we also have in the individual in the backyard photographs. Larry Rivera, as I have observed, has confirmed this by doing a superposition on the body of a photograph of Roscoe Y, and it's an exact fit. I don't think there's any room for doubt about it. Here's a ghost image, a cutout that one would use if you were going to fabricate a photograph like this, found in the desk of a Dallas detective who insisted he was just trying to figure out if it could be done, having nothing to do with it being done. But obviously, that's just a wobber. Meanwhile, returning to the area of the doorway, where we have the image of Lee Oswald looking out, or what may be Lee Oswald. It's interesting that the arrest report for Lee Oswald, which is timed at 140, when he was only arrested at 150, already states definitively, this man shot and killed President John F. Kennedy and police officer J.D. Tippett. He also shot and wounded Governor John Conley. Mind you, they haven't even made the arrest, but the conclusion is already baldly stated there. What more proof would you need that this was a frame-up job? That came from Jesse Curry's JFK assassination file, by the way, where Jesse Curry was the head of the Dallas Police Department until he retired and went to work for 7-Eleven stores and published a book in paperback only available through those outlets which included many fascinating photographs and other documents. According to the official account, Lee left his rooming house, and it appears was actually heading for the Texas Theater, going straight up Crawford Street, when turning onto Jefferson Boulevard, which would have been a direct route. But according to the official story, he deviated up 10th Street for no discernible reason, had an encounter with Officer Tibbet, who was shot four times, three times in the chest and once in the right temple, where the slugs that were, uh, the, the shell casings that were originally recovered came from an automatic, which exonerates Oswald because he had a revolver. So the first officer on the scene put his initials on the four automatic shell casings. Subsequently, there'd be an exchange, and now you had shell casings that were from a revolver, but no longer had the initials of the uh, first officer on the scene. They also claimed to have found a jacket that belonged to Lee Oswald and, and a wallet, which is bizarre because Lee Oswald had his wallet when he was arrested at the Texas Theater. I mean, how many wallets does a guy carry at the same time? Going back to the backyard photograph, this is the classic image from uh, uh, Robert Roden. Notice how many indications of, of alteration here, the missing shoulder, the imposition of black tie man, the face has been obliterated here. This figure is known as Black Hole Man. His shirt has been obliterated, this face too. 
all for what would turn out to be very good reasons. Billy Lovelady, a co-worker of Lee's, who said he thought it was odd they'd be confused because Billy himself said he was two to three inches shorter and 15 to 20 pounds heavier, was asked by the FBI to come in wearing the same shirt he'd worn at the time uh, for, on the 29th of February, 1964. And they took photographs of Billy wearing the same shirt he'd been wearing at the time, a short sleeve, red and white, vertically striped shirt. Notice, oddly, they had him unbutton the shirt, no doubt to try to make it look more like a long sleeve, richly textured shirt to which it bears no correspondence. Here's the official report that was sent by the FBI in Dallas to J. Edgar Hoover uh, that uh, he, he stated he was wearing a red and white vertically striped shirt and jeans, which they duly photographed claiming this was the man in the doorway, hoping J. Edgar would not notice that he bore no resemblance to the man in the doorway. Larry Rivera has done extensive research. He's mastered the principles of photogrammetry, which is the application of mathematics to photographs. And here you see he's comparing the image of Lee Oswald with the image of Billy Lovelady to determine which one fits the facial features of the man in the doorway. Here's a GIF he created where you can see the man in the doorway turn into Lee Oswald. The key is to have the images taken from the same perspective and then superimpose the interpupillary distance, the distance between the pupils of the two eyes, and you'll find the features will fall into place if indeed it's one and the same person, otherwise they will not. Here you can see that it's Lee Oswald. The man in the doorway turns into Lee Oswald. Here on the left, you see Lee Oswald, but on the right, Billy Lovelady. You'll notice Billy Lovelady cannot be the man in the doorway. The ears are wrong, the nose is wrong, the jaw is wrong. It's obviously Lee Oswald and not Billy Lovelady. However, Billy was there. The man with the hands up raised turns out to have been Billy Lovelady. He was protecting his eyes from the sun. So that Larry has now done a reconstruction of uh, the setting in the doorway, had it been, for example, in color, it would, uh, it, it would have had obvious features. Richard Hook has reconstructed how they altered the film, how, how they took uh, images and moved them around, including Black Tie Man, who was moved into the photograph, where they used a smiling woman with a child, uh, where they blacked out the face of Billy Lovelady while they obfuscated the face of Appears to have been Bill Shelley, who was their supervisor. Lee had actually told Will Fritz during his interrogation that he was out front with Bill Shelley, who obviously could have confirmed it had it been so disposed, but it appears the book depository itself was a CIA operation. So unbeknownst to Lee, he was surrounded by CIA operatives. So here's what Larry Rivera has reconstructed. Notice how Billy would have stood out in his short sleeve, vertically striped shirt as opposed to Lee Oswald. Here's a photograph taken from a slightly greater distance back where Larry has been doing completely brilliant work. Let me mention, by the way, that Larry has a new book entitled The JFK Horseman available at moonrockbooks.com. This has to be one of the most important books ever published in the history of the assassination of JFK. I rank it very highly and encourage those who are serious about assassination research to pick up a copy from moonrockbooks.com. One of the claims made by apologists for the Warren Commission was that the Alchins photograph was already published Friday night and therefore cannot have been subject to alteration, but in fact it actually only appeared on Saturday. But the CI, with its massive assets, was able to go back and for very select newspapers create a new edition. This is the phony edition on the right of the News Palladium, as Ralph Sinkay discovered. Ralph has done a great deal of brilliant work, some of which I'm unable to elaborate here, but it appears that actually it was an FBI agent who was used to shoot Lee Oswald in the Dallas Police Department basement, not Jack Ruby himself who always insisted he could never remember having shot Lee Oswald. No doubt it was because he had not shot Lee Oswald. But this just shows the extent to which they're willing to go to fabricate whole new issues, fake editions of newspapers to fabricate the evidence. 
So to understand the assassination, you have to draw a distinction between the sponsors, the facilitators, and the mechanics. The sponsors are the individuals and groups who wanted LBJ out and LBJ in primarily because of the differences in their policies. Though with respect to the anti-Castro Cubans, they wanted retaliation for what they believed was their abandonment at the Bay of Pigs. The CIA was threatened by JFK because uh, he had uh, threatened to shatter it into a thousand pieces. Would have been a good thing to do then. It would still be a good thing to do now. The Joint Chiefs were disillusioned with JFK because he'd not invaded Cuba, contrary to the unanimous recommendation. He'd gone ahead and signed an above-ground test ban treaty with the Soviet Union against our unanimous opposition. And now he was pulling our forces out of Vietnam when the Joint Chiefs believed that a stand had to be taken against the expansion of international godless communism. So they threw in with the assassination, the plot to take out JFK. The anti-Castro Cubans, as I observed, believed falsely that Jack had abandoned them at the Bay of Pigs. It was actually the actions of the CIA where, by the way, they had learned that the Soviets knew the date of the invasion and had notified Fidel Castro. So Fidel knew we were coming. The Soviets knew we were coming. The CIA knew they knew we were coming. Everyone knew what was going on except the commander-in-chief, which the agency refused to inform. Jack certainly would have called it off under these circumstances. It turned out to be a great fiasco where the invasion was overseen by George Herbert Walker Bush, although allegedly he had not been a member of the agency prior to being made director. That was complete nonsense, poppycock. It turns out that he actually was uh, in charge of the operation, which was codenamed Operation Zapata. That was the name of the Bush oil company, uh, drilling company. I believe had it been a success, Zapata, would have had concessions to drill all over the Caribbean basin. Two of the ships were rechristened just before the invasion. One was renamed Barbara, another Houston, indicative of who was in charge here. The mafia were upset with JFK because Bobby, as attorney general, is bringing more indictments and convictions than ever before in history. Indeed, even J. Edgar had been reluctant to acknowledge the existence of organized crime because although J. Edgar had sex dossiers on members of Congress, where say uh, one of their agents would drop in on the office of a senator just to confide that they have come into possession of a photograph of him in bed with a mistress to reassure the senator they're gonna make sure this doesn't get into the wrong hands as, as they are leaving. Remind the senator how they hope he will support the FBI the next time the opportunity arises. Uh, uh, the mob had compromising photographs of J. Edgar with his close personal friend Clyde Tolson. So until the Joe Bellacci hearing where he spelled out the existence and structure of organized crime in such detail that it was no longer politically palatable to deny, J. Edgar had not acknowledged the existence of organized crime. The Fed, moreover, in the Eastern establishment were upset with JFK because he published United States notes uh, uh, in the belief that it was absurd for the government to be paying interest to a consortium of private banks to print the currency of the United States. The vast national debt we hear so much about is compound interest on what we owe to the bank, to the Fed, for printing the currency of the United States. It's that bad. I recall as a young Marine Corps officer holding one of these bills in my hand, I actually have one on the opposite side of the computer here, which had a red embossed imprint that said United States note, rather the green embossed saying uh, Federal Reserve note. Jack was right about it. Ron Paul has been emphatic about it. Maybe Donald Trump will do something about it. It would be a boon for the nation. Texas oilmen were also upset with JFK because he was threatening to abolish the oil depletion allowance, which was a massive tax write-off that they had engineered based on the specious argument that all, since oil was a finite resource, as they pumped oil out of the ground, they were putting themselves out of business. And David Ben-Gurion, who was a founder and the first prime minister of Israel, and JFK 
were butting heads over Ben-Gurion's desire that Israel develop nuclear weapons, particularly at their research facility in Demona, which they would not allow to be inspected. JFK was emphatic that Israel not develop nuclear weapons because he believed it would ignite a nuclear arms race in the Middle East. Ben-Gurion resigned in disgust, but apparently only after he'd uh, assigned the Mossad to participate in the assassination of the President of the United States. The facilitators who made it happen were Lyndon Johnson of the assassination and J. Edgar Hoover of the cover up. Uh, uh, to understand Lyndon's role here, you have to go back to the uh, Democratic Convention of 1960, where Jack beat, where Jack beat, uh, uh, where Jack beat uh, Lyndon for the nomination, uh, but where he invited Stuart Symington of Missouri to be his running mate and where uh, uh, gave him overnight to think about it, but where Bobby went by the Johnson suite to make a pro forma invitation to Linda to run as his running mate, never imagining he would give up the, the powerful position of Senate majority leader for what has been described as an office not worth a bucket of warm, you've heard spit, but the actual word was pits, not worth a bucket of warm pits, but instead, Lyndon jumped on it, and, and he threatened to expose that JFK had Addison's disease and was not expected to live a long, normal life, that he had dalliances with beautiful women, some of whom were spies for East Germany, and moreover, he told Bobby that if he were not on the ticket, that any legislative proposal sent down by the White House would be dead on arrival, because in his position as a powerful majority leader, he would bottle them up. Bobby and Jack were boxed in, and for the only time in his life, Jack had to rescind a political decision and offer Lyndon Johnson the position as his running mate. When one of LBJ's wealthy benefactors learned of this, he became enraged and, and, uh, and burst into the Johnson suite cursing and swearing that now LBJ will help JFK become president of the United States. Bobby Baker took him into a bedroom and explained what they had in mind. He came out all smiles saying he thought that was an excellent plan. Bobby Baker would later declare in public that Jack Kennedy would not survive his first term in office and that he would die a violent death. Lyndon Johnson, in fact, would send his chief administrative assistant, Cliff Carter, down to Dallas to make sure all the arrangements for the assassination were in place. He would also create the Warren Commission and put the FBI in charge so that Edgar, who hated the Kennedys as much as LBJ, would be responsible for the investigation and could guarantee the cover-up. Meanwhile, the mechanics, the shooters, the supervisors, and coordinators included, and this may come as a shock to some, George Herbert Walker Bush and Edward Lansdale. Here's a photograph of the three tramps who I am convinced now were backup patsies. Uh, they were uh, the third of the three I got to know personally, Chauncey Marvin Hole. He was instructed to prepare 15 sets of Ford Secret Service credentials and to leave them in a red pickup truck that would be parked in the parking lot behind the grassy knoll, which was used by the Dallas police. When he arrived there, the pickup truck was not to be seen. He wandered around Dealey Plaza and said he saw more bad guys, more mercenaries and hitmen than they'd find at a soldiers of fortune convention. When he returned, the, the truck was there and he left the, the forged Secret Service credentials and proceeded in the company of Charles Rogers, whom he knew as Richard Montoya and Charles Harrelson, who's the father of the actor Woody Harrelson, to a railroad car that would appear to be locked but would be in fact unlocked. When they climbed in, they found it was loaded with explosives, ammunition, and weapons. The, the train started to pull out and they thought they got away, but the railroad supervisor had noticed something strange, called it back, and police apprehended them. Here they were being marched through the grassy, the, the, the Dealey Plaza, where Chauncey was carrying a paper bag with a a custom-made weapon and some communication equipment of a novel origin. What's important here is in this photograph, a figure is walking past them, which would have been improper had this been a real event, meaning had they really been under arrest, 
who's been identified by no less authorities than Victor Krulak, a former Marine Corps general, much celebrated, and Fletcher Prouty, as none other than Edward Lansdale, for whom Prouty worked, who was in charge of assassinations all over the country, especially in Vietnam. Many of us, including Mike Sparks, who's quite a brilliant guy, believe that the assassination shows all the signatures of Edward Lansdale having positioned the shooters and determined the sequence in sh of shots. I believe I was the first to identify in Jesse Curry's JFK assassination file a photograph of George Herbert Walker Bush standing in front of the book depository. And here we have a later photograph where Lansdale's waiting to speak to Bush about the assassination. I mentioned that window from the uranium mining company uh, on the second floor of the Dow Texas building. Well, Richard Hook has done some absolutely brilliant work, and he's not only identified Nestor Tony Escadro, but behind him, the hairline of George Herbert Walker Bush. I have no doubt that uh, uh, Richard has it exactly right. In fact, it turns out Deputy Sheriff Roger Craig reported that Jim Garrison, he knew of tw 12 arrests made in Dealey Plaza that day. One in particular was made by R. E. Vaughn of the Dallas Police Department of a man coming out of the Dow Tax who said he was an independent oil operator from Houston, Texas. That prisoner was taken from Vaughn by Dallas police detectives, and that was the last he saw of him. No mugshot, no interview, no fingerprints or name is in existence of this mystery man. Independent oil operator from Houston, however, was always George Bush's CIA cover. Exactly why was he arrested? Garrison reported the man came running out of the Dow Tex building and authorities could hardly avoid arresting him because of the clamor of onlookers. He was taken to the sheriff's office for questioning, although there is no record of it. Meanwhile, other officials from the CIA were at the corner of Houston and Maine paying their last respects to the President of the United States, including uh, Grayson Lynch, Eddie Bayo, a person here wrongly identified as David Morales, who was involved in the assassination. Uh, 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 but this is a fellow named uh, Pishini who uh, looked a lot like him, Ted Shackley, Rip Robertson, and Tracy Barnes. In addition, uh, Noel Twyman has laid to rest the, the myth that no one talked, identifying many who had talked about the assassination, Carlos Marcello bragging that Jack would be killed, describing how it would be done, Santo Tropicani bragging that he would be killed, Joseph Miltier bragging Jack would be killed, Johnny Roselli, Sam Giancana's right-hand man, telling Jack Anderson years later, Ruby was their man who was ordered to silence Oswald. David Atley Phillips, suspected of being the mysterious Maurice Bishop, uh, uh, talked about it, said fringe elements of U.S. intelligence may have been involved. Lyndon Johnson's mistress, Madeline Brown, with whom I had over 100 conversations, said Lyndon implied before he was assassinated that it was going to go down. Uh, Marita Lawrence uh, uh, stated uh, uh, in depositions that Frank Sturgis had told her he and a group of anti-Castro Cubans had been involved. Sam Giancana's brother, Chuck, revealed in a recent book, Double Cross, his brother had confessed to being involved. Chauncey Holt went on interviews on radio and spoke with me about it. Charles Harrelson talked about it. Jim Hicks was a communication coordinator. Jack Ruby, Billy Saul Estes. That's fascinating. If you go through alternative possibilities as to how it was done, the evidence rules out all the alternatives except the ultimate black op that it was a coup d'etat where uh, Noel Twyman got it right. He, in his brilliant book, saw the most perfect combination with the greatest probability of success was combining the CIA military with the Secret Service, the Mafia, LBJ, and Hoover. Lyndon, as vice president, was in contact with all of the parties here, including the military, the CIA, and of course, he and Hoover were close friends. They were neighbors in Washington, D.C., where Hoover was even the godfather to one of Lyndon's daughters. Uh, Lyndon would schmooze with the Secret Service at the White House regularly and induce their participation in the assassination. With LBJ and the conspiratorial group, Hoover could have been relied upon to fall in line uh, the mafia having compromised him, 
uh, LBJ would be the most valuable member because he would become president and thereby have immediate authority over the entire executive branch, which included the Secret Service, the military, the CIA, and the FBI. This represents the entire investigative and prosecuting capability of the United States government, with a possible exception of congressional investigating committees where LBJ preempted them by creating the Warren Commission, which he had staffed with close allies. Interestingly, if you actually pay attention, in the, in the, in the New York Times paperback edition of the Warren Report, there's a photograph showing the approximate location of the bullet to the back five and a half inches below the collar, which means it could not possibly have tra tra traversed JFK's neck and exited the throat, going into the back of John Connolly. More importantly, here we have the real mastermind of the assassination. Phil Nelson has a completely brilliant book, LBJ, Mastermind of JFK's Assassination. E. Howard Hunt, who has often been misidentified as a third of the three tramps, who was actually Chauncey Marvin Hall, on his deathbed at a time he believed he was dying, reported to his son, St. John, whom I have met and known, that the chain of command went from Lyndon uh, Johnson to, uh, 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 to Cord Meyer, to David Atley uh, Phillips, uh, to uh, uh, William Harvey, to David Morales, and then from Morales down to the other shooters and participants that I've already described. So there you have uh, that from A to Z, what happened to JFK, who is responsible and why. If you want more on solving the world's greatest murder mystery, check out JFK, Who, How, and Why, my fourth book, where I brought together experts on different aspects of the assassination together in one place. That's available at moonrockbooks.com. I also highly recommend Larry Rivera's book, the JFK Horseman, which I've already spoken about. And for those who want a, a video introduction, you got it right here. If you go to the raw deal for 22 November 2019, which will be made available at 153news.net, and you can follow all of these events. I have many other videos about the assassination of JFK. They're also available if you search for them under Jim Fetzer, JFK. He was a great man, and it's sad to say that the forces who took him out then still exert their influence today. These governmental entities, like the FBI and the CIA, regard themselves as the permanent custodians of the nation, viewing presidents as transient figures who come and go. J. Edgar even designated the FBI the seat of government, meaning he was really the man in control and sad to say in many ways he was. Don't Let Yourself Be Played. There's a new book by David Talbot entitled The Devil's Chessboard that seeks to voice off responsibility upon Alan Dulles, who was in the head of the agency but was removed by JFK when he also took out Charles Cabell, a lieutenant general who is the, the brother of the mayor of Dallas, who it turns out joined the CIA himself in 1956, Earl Cabell and Richard Bissell, director of plans, when he discovered how they'd betray him at the Bay of Pigs. But Alan Dulles was a peripheral figure, the mover and shaker, the mastermind behind the assassination of JFK was LBJ. It was indeed all the way with LBJ.